I'm so happy to have uh, my brother, Reggie. He was a pastor in Mountain View, Arkansas. And, and uh, like my dad, he has a teaching gift. And so God honored him to go into Africa. And uh, he taught for several years in the Bible school. And now he's, uh, he's gone native. You can see uh, he is uh, wearing a headdress. My, my sister-in-law is not wearing her headdress today. But we thank them. You know, I, I was thinking of the scripture where Jesus said, if you give a cup of water in my name. And so I'm glad that this church has had a part in helping to fulfill that. You know, uh, in Africa, there's a lot of places where they don't have water. And uh, uh, so we're thankful we're a small part of that. I'm going to ask my brother to come. Uh, at the conclusion of the service, this is the day that we're honor my brother-in-law, uh, Rick Mitchell, and uh, this is a special day. We're thankful to see all his family here, and uh, we have a presentation to make at the end of the service. Come on, Reggie. I believe that he is the only way of salvation, and uh, I believe that his blood washes whiter than snow. Hallelujah. I want to go into the book of Acts this morning. I, I want to thank everyone. Church looks good. Amen. So wonderful to see the fruit uh, of labor I was reading. I forgot it was 1983. Somewhere around that time, my brother and I came to the old church and preaching a meeting together when the Lord Amen. spoke to him. That's before the Lord blessed me with my wife, I think. We were at that meeting, and uh, we have, uh, there were six of us in our family, my oldest sister's back there, I have a brother that works uh, in a church, uh, North Point, uh, on uh, Airline Drive, he works there, I have a, well, there were six of us, but the Lord chose uh, my brother, Danny, and I, called us into the ministry. And uh, I questioned the Lord's wisdom <laughs> I, uh, when he called me into the ministry when he uh, sent me over to Africa. I thought that I was the last person that needed to go over there. I thought they had enough problems without me. But I guess the Lord saw it differently. And uh, the Lord sent me over there to, to teach them. Uh, I pastored, th I've been... Uh, August of this year, I started my 45th year of ministry. Uh, been been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and uh, always been a student of the Bible. And the Lord sent me over and said, "Just go and teach them what I've taught you. Go teach them faith. Go teach them the things of God." And so we've been diligent to do that. And then uh, a few years ago, the Lord pushed us out into a ministry of feeding hungry people there. I mean, kids are connected to us. Of all things, we had a little boy about, at the time, is about seven or eight years old that uh, pushed us out into the ministry of feeding the hungry. And uh, we got a check in the mail one day for $1,007.57 and a letter that uh, went with it uh, from one of our partners. And she's, uh, boys homeschooled, mother was reading, uh, they were reading this, our newsletter together. And we were talking about how COVID had had hurt Africa and touched this little boy. He went to his room, got his piggy bank, dumped out $3.57. Told his mama, told his grandma, said, we got to send this to Reggie and Ron and Moffitt. We got to send them over there, help, help feed those people. And then he, he said, call my dad. I, I want him to give me a job. I, I need to make some money. So his dad had a bread route. Boy went with him one day, and I guess that was enough <laughs> for the dad. But he gave him $4. So we had this check for $1,007.57. This lady had gotten some money, one of the COVID checks, and she gave a tithe and uh, offering to her church, gave the rest to us, said, feed, feed, feed the people. We've told you this before, but I'll tell you again. So we, uh, we've been feeding people ever since that time, and uh, we have fed hundreds of people. Well, I can't say hundreds. We fed hundreds of my, my secretary keeps up with all this. And so uh, 
I, I don't know, you, you want to talk to the man in charge or the woman that knows what's going on. She's talked to her. But uh, the, the Lord has uh, laid it on my wife's heart for this water well. We were, we were uh, talking to this lady. You saw her. She was uh, the, the, the only white lady in that little uh, video that was there. And she didn't ask us for it. The Lord just put it on her heart to, 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 to do this water well. And so it's just been miraculous what God has done. Uh, and, and we thank everyone and know the blessings of God will be on you for all that you do. Now, in the book of Acts, uh, you know, the book of Acts is important to us, not just for historical sense, but, it's, but we see two churches that, are, that we, we could study from the book of Acts. First church we see is the church at Jerusalem. Praise God, big church. Grew to over 8,000 members. That's the uh, day of Pentecost. God poured out the Holy Ghost there. And, and it just poured out in great, great thundering power, spilled out into the streets, and uh, had 3,000, the first message that Peter ever preached. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so uh, 3,000 were saved that way, baptized, brought into the church. Another time, there were 5,000 more added, and God added to people every day. Praise God. Church of Jerusalem was a mighty church had mighty signs and wonders and miracles. Their pastor would walk down the street and just the aura that was around him, his shadow would touch people, would be healed. God gave great witness to those people. Great persecution followed the witness of God. One of the greatest things that could be said about the church at Jerusalem is its own, the, the, the enemies of the church told him this, said, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. I never had anybody say that about churches I pastored. They never said, well, you, you have filled this city with your doctrine. Praise God. So they did a wonderful job. See, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, he said that, you know, we need to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. Jerusalem was very good at going to their own home city. And, you know, this church has done a wonderful job reaching out to the community that is around it. But... There was a problem there. They had all 12 of the apostles were there at that church. And, and they had great blessing there. God blessed them. And uh, the people sold property. They brought all kinds of things, laid offerings down at the apostles' feet. And, and they just had this wonderful reservoir of money. And, uh, but I think they missed it there because they just started feeding everybody and and, and just feeding on the word and forgot about the world. And I think as we look there, it's, it seems to be, to me, uh, kind of strange that here was the enemy of the church, a man named Saul of Tarsus. Amen, he was ready to travel, but the apostles weren't. They were content right there. Now, they had a lot of, lot of people and they needed training, but I don't know that they needed all 12 of them. They needed to branch out. But... Uh, God took this man named Saul, met him on the road to Damascus, and, and uh, he's an amazing man. Uh, I've, listened, I've listened to people talk about him. If you want to go on the internet, you can look up a man named Gary Habermas, and he'll talk to you about the Apostle Paul. Gary Habermas, is, he has even lectured at Oxford University, Cambridge, Edinburgh, the pinnacles of, of uh, educational success. And he has talked about the Apostle Paul, and even, even atheists will tell you this about that man. They will say that the man that wrote the book of Romans, Amen. not only was he an educated person, not only was he highly educated, they will tell you that the man that wrote the book of Romans was an absolute genius. That whoever wrote that book, and they declare that the apostle Paul wrote it. They even declare, even atheists will tell you that the apostle Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. He wrote those books that was not a scribe, but that he wrote those things. And so here is a great witness of that apostle when he said that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared unto me. Amen. So there is a witness, and there is absolutely no other reason why this man, who was an enemy of the church, that compelled people to blaspheme, 
that, that compelled people to say, are you or are you not a Christian? And when they said that, he put some in prison and some of them he put to death. But when he got to Damascus on that day, the Bible says that they were shocked because this man is now preaching the very thing that he fought against his whole life. And there's only one reason that such a thing would happen. And that is that he met the risen Lord. He met him. And he met him like Peter, James, and John saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw him in all his power and in all of his glory. Jesus is alive. Amen, that was the message that he began to preach. And so he, he uh, went to a church called Antioch. And Antioch was different than Jerusalem. I don't think Antioch ever had the numbers. But you know, when you got God in your congregation, you don't need large numbers. Hallelujah. Because, because when you got God, you got all, you ever, all you'll ever need. I, I don't read of Antioch having eight or 9,000 people, but I do, I do read this. Antioch was different than Jerusalem because Antioch was a sending church. They sent missionaries all over the world. It was from the church at Antioch that the Apostle Paul took his first missionary journey with, with a man named Barnabas. And they began, to, they began to touch the Gentile world like it had never been touched before. Peter obeyed God and Peter opened the door, but Peter did not walk through the door. <clears throat> but this man named Paul walked through the door and he walked around the known world. Wouldn't you like to have been a member at the church at Antioch and have got in on the ground floor of the ministry and the mission of the Apostle Paul? Hallelujah. God gave those people in that little, little town of Antioch. Antioch is in the city of Turkey. I have a friend of mine who pastors a church there. And, and he, but sometimes when people go visit, he'll take them down to show them, you know, the, the, the church there. The, there's still ruins of the Roman Empire in that place. This is where Paul preached. This is where these things happened. Hallelujah. You can, you can still go down the Appian Way if you, you, if you see those things. But Antioch sent people to the world. Now the thing about the sending church was they were also a receiving church. Hallelujah. You see, there is a universal law of God when he made this planet and whatever you give is what you're going to receive. So, uh, you know, we, we use that scripture out of uh, Luke, uh, you know, give and it shall be given unto you in good measure pressed down. And sometimes people say, well, y'all use that for money, but he, he doesn't mention money there. Truth is, he doesn't have to mention money there because that's just a universal law. Whatever you give, you're going to get back. So let me caution you, men. Don't give your wife grief or you're going to get a hundredfold return on that. <laughs> Hallelujah. But whatever you release and give into this earth, you're going to get it back. And because these people were willing to send this man of God forward, God gave them something back. Hallelujah. And so uh, I, I, I have a message today for your church. And, and here, here's what God is, is wanting to say to Believers Worship Center right here in Benton, Louisiana, is, is you don't have to have thousands, but all you have to do is have a heart right before God. And, and God is calling you to become a sending church. You, you've, you're, you've, you've reached, you're reaching your community that God's going to give you an opportunity to reach the world. Amen. Amen. God is going to give you an opportunity to begin to touch the world right here. You, you don't have to go with me. You're welcome to go with me. Would love to take you. Praise God, pack your bag, get your passport, and we will go. But you can touch the world through me and through others that come through here. Amen. Amen. Now, you say, well, uh, it's, it's going to take a lot of money to do that. Well, God's got a lot of money. Hallelujah. God says in His Word in the book of Haggai, He says, the silver and the gold are mine. Hallelujah. They are mine. God told David, you know, David got, got interested in the Lord having to sleep out in that tent. And God said, well, that's real sweet, David. But if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. I have the cattle on a thousand hills. Uh, it, it is all mine. The silver and the gold is mine. It, it belongs to me. 
And in the, in the book of Samuel, when, uh, as you read in there, the Bible says that God's able to raise one up and God is able to set another one down. And so what we're seeing here happen is we're seeing God begin to raise up certain people and we're going to see God put down certain people. I remember a number of years ago, uh, several decades ago, I was preaching, I was pastoring in a place and the Spirit of the Lord came on me and I began to tell the people that a certain minister, that, uh, very powerful, was touching the nation, that, that he was going to fall, that, that everything was going to change. And of course, everybody came up after church to ask me about that, but I said, well, let's just see if I heard from God or that was just out of the foolishness of my heart or my head or other, but we heard from God because it was not too long after that that it all just fell apart. God does raise people up and God does transfer wealth from one place to another. Now, uh, I, I lived up in Arkansas, a little old town of 2,500 people called Mountain View. And if you ever want to take a nice vacation, that's a place to go. It's just a wonderful place. Enjoyed living there. But, uh, you know, some people can't live in a big city like, like that. It's just too much. That, that suburban living is too much. They've got to go. they got to move out to the suburbs, places like Oney, Arkansas, population 100, or, or even, you know, a little old town called Timbo, Arkansas, which is, which is about 30 miles from nowhere. And I had a friend of mine that pastored that church in Timbo, Arkansas. Now, is this going to squeal if I walk around the church? No, you go. And, and, and he pastored in, in Timbo, Arkansas. Uh, Brother David Campbell still is a friend of mine. And he pastored there. His father pastored there. His father was an Assemblies of God minister that went to, uh, went to Timbo, Arkansas, told, told his denominational leaders that God was sending him to that church and I was sending him there to build a church, and they said, no, you, you can't build a church there. They said the brightest and best we've ever had tried, and they failed, and if they didn't make it, there's no way you could make it. But when they found out that he was going to go, whether they blessed him or not, they let him go, and, but here's what they told him. They said, David, if, if, you, if you do happen to build something up there, this is what they told him. Man said this out of his own mouth. Well, if you do build something there, don't drive the nails all the way in so that when you fail, you can pull the nails out with a crowbar and at least take the lumber with you somewhere else. So with, with inspiration and encouragement like that, he had to go. And he went down there to build a church, a, a Pentecostal, tongue-talking church in, in the middle of that country. And he had a man that owned a store that said that you know, uh, you know he was he was talking to him and he said I'll sell you I'll sell you this property over here to you know to build a church so he was going to build a church the man called him back here a few days later and said I can't sell you this property because the the people of the community said if you sell that preacher that church down there we will never buy from your store again we'll drive we don't care if we have to drive fifty miles away but we will, if you let him in here. We won't, we won't do business with you. So he said, I can't sell you the property. But later that day, Brother Campbell's dad got a call from a man said, I've got a little land down here by, by, out, out in this area. I'll sell it to you. He said, I can't do nothing with it anyway. People down there drinking whiskey and gambling all the time anyway. So Brother Campbell said, well, well that's a great place to build a church right down there where all the cinders are. I'm, you know, no, you won't have to look for them. So he went and he built a church. But over time, brother, uh, he passed away. Brother David took the church over. David was his, his son. And, and David made, uh, uh, you know, he, he got some property. And I was preaching at his church. And he, he told me that story. And uh, he, he, he built a nice sanctuary and uh, was, was talking to him because he, he began to tell me what he was doing for world missions. And I said, out here in the middle of nowhere, he, he told me how many hundreds of thousands of dollars they had given to world missions. I was there preaching one night. My wife wasn't there with me that particular time. But there were about 30-something people in the church, and I was telling them about the first time we went, how that, you know, we, we, I didn't have anything. You know, we, I had no money. 
but, you know, we were supposed to go. I had our tickets bought on credit, and we were supposed to go. And I told them about how that you know, man met us and, and handed us a check, folded over, and said, I hope this helps. Well, uh, it was a $5,000 check he handed me. I said, well, that's great. And, and that, that day I was preaching, and Brother Campbell got up and said, well, you know, uh, and I, I told him about another check I'd got for, and I said, for 1000 made 6000 I said, my wife and I lived off that, that, that first, the entire year we lived off that over there. But uh, he got up and said, well, folks, we need to give this man, you know, I believe he said $5,000, so we're going to write him a check for 5000 He didn't have 30 people there. I said, praise the Lord. Then one man said, well, no, brother, brother, brother David, that's wrong. And I thought, well, I knew he was going to show up. But then he said, no, I believe the man said it was 6000 I think we need to it was 6000 I said, wow, my new best friend back there. But uh, I was talking to Brother David, and he was talking about the thousands they had given. And I said, you, you have to tell me what's going on here, because this is Timbo, Arkansas, 30 miles from nowhere. I, when I moved up there, I had to tell the people the, the war was over. They didn't know this. I said, war... How, where's all this money coming from? And he said, well, let me tell you the story. He said, uh, I was, he said, I was, Brother David said, I was in the sanctuary just walking around praying. It's a good thing for preachers to do, isn't it? And he said, the Lord asked me a question. And he said, David, what are you doing for world missions? I said, well, Lord, you know, you know, anytime I hear a missionary, we have them come in, take up an offering for them. And the Lord said, so you're, you're not doing anything. He said, now, when the Lord tells you you're doing nothing, you don't argue with him. I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, David, I want you to take up a special offering on the last Sunday night of the month. And I want you to tell your people this is a missions offering and that we're, we're going to take this offering and we're going to send that in to, district, uh, to, to the headquarters to support missions. And David said, I told the Lord, I said, Lord... This is Timbo, Arkansas. Ain't nobody got money Sunday. The last Sunday of the month, everybody's broke. They started calling it broke Sunday offering. The Lord told David, says, you tell the people that if they will give into this offering, I will see to it that they start the month with money in their checking account. So David said, I got up and I told the people what the Lord said. And he said, you know, being the great man of faith that I am, David made a living as a school teacher. He, you know, he said, we had $400, I think, in our, in our account. So I told the people when we took that offering up, I told them what the Lord said, take it on Sunday night. And the Lord says, if you'll give in to this offering, he will see that you start the month with money. You won't be broke. And, but he said, I told the people, I said, now, folks, if we don't get $100, can I take funds from the, the you know, account and, and make, make a $100 check to mail in. It says, you know, every, every Assembly of God church in Arkansas would send in $100 a month to World Mission. That'd be a lot of money. So they agreed. He said, we took up broke Sunday night offering. We had $1,557 and some change came in in the offering. I said, where did y'all get this money? Well, somebody had sold cows, some man had sold timber, some guy got a refund check from his insurance. And he said, it just started. He said, we started getting these offerings. And he said, it's just amazing what God was doing. So he said, uh, I, you know, district council was coming up. And he said, I was praying and asking God, what do you want us to do? You know, there's going to be four missionaries there. What do you want us to do? And he said, the Lord said to me, David, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the bank. And I want you to find out what you owe on your, on your property. And if you will give a tenth of that to these missionaries, I'll pay your building off. And he said, Lord, I will do that. He said, but could you let someone else say this? Because I'm, I'm getting tired of telling the people the Lord said. So he said, I call a little meeting. Sunday, you know, before district council, I said, now, folks, there's going to be four missionaries at this district council. Uh, what do we want to do for them? And he said, the last person on earth that you would ever think would say this stood up and said, well, Brother, Brother David, I think we ought to, ought to give a tithe off what we owe against the church, give it to them, and just believe God pay the building off. 
So I said, okay, that's what we'll do. Now it was like 23, it wasn't a, it was $23,000. It wasn't like bazillions of dollars, but like 23,000, that's still a lot of money. And it came out a little less than 600 for each of these missions. And he said, in less than six weeks time, the building was completely paid off. And he said, I went into my friend, you know, I, he said, president of the bank, you know, just, just before we moved up there, there was only one bank. And then word got out, you know, and then all these other banks came. But uh, anyway, he said, the president of the bank was my friend. I went in and told him we wanted to get our mortgage certificate. We're going to pay it off and have a burning of the certificate. And he said, well, David, don't do that. He said, just, you know, just, just keep the mortgage. He said, you know, the certificate and all. Borrow $200 against it. Just because if you ever need to borrow money for, for, for us to go out there and, and you know, do, do this paper and the property's worth so much, that's going to cost you money. Just, you already got it, just keep it. And he said, I guess I my mouth started prophesying because I told him, I said, no, we're never going to borrow any money ever again. And he said, in the last 10 years, we have given a million one hundred and fifty-seven thousand six hundred and some odd dollars to world missions. And at that point, I had to ask him, where are y'all getting this money? This is Tembo, Arkansas, 30 miles from the middle of nowhere. And he says, I don't know where it comes in. He said, people, people call me all the time. He said, in fact, I got two checks in my office now, $50,000 each. Two doctors called me up and said, are you the missionary man? He said, well, I guess I am. Can I help you? He said, well, I'm Dr. So-and-so. I'm sending you a check for $50,000. You know the missionaries do what you want to with it. He said, it just, it just pours in like this. Hallelujah. Now, what I'm here to tell this church is, God is about to do a miracle in your midst. God is about to open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. You're going to spread it to the world. God, tell, I know this is my brother, but you listen to me because I, I do stand in the office of the prophet. And as God wills, I have to speak a word over people. But God said, I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to make this church rich. Amen. I'm going to, I'm going to, there are people who I raise up that have not done what I have told them to do with the money. So I'm taking the money from them and I'm going to bring it here. And, and I'm going to place it in the, the hands of people that will do with the money what I want them to do. Because we're, we're, the Lord is coming soon, and that's not an escape theology. That's a hustle and, and work fast theology. So I'm going, to bring, I'm going to bring the wealth of this world to you. Now, some of it is going to come through the people who are sitting here in these in this chairs of this, uh, of this church right now. God's going to do things in your life that you never thought possible. I heard R.W. Scheinbach told a story about a guy that went out and, and was just driving by a, a, a used car lot. And God told him, pull in there and go buy that white truck. And he was, told the Lord, I don't need a truck. But the Lord told him, buy the truck. Make a long story short, the Lord told him, look under the air breather of the truck. And when he did, there was a sack in there full of $100 bills. Somebody was using that as his hiding spot. I, I, I met a man down in New Orleans. Was talking about that, you know, down there we have battered women. And so we, uh, sometimes people donate these homes and, and, and the, we, we get these properties. And he said, we renovate some of these. And he said, we had this one piece of property. I was thinking about renovating it with five gallons of gas and a match was what I thought this thing was worth. But my wife said no, so we compromised and did what my wife said. And he said, he said it was right on a waterway, and there was an old, old boathouse out there. And the end of the money, all the money we had, I told this guy, take this, you know, these little bitty toy bulldozer things, you know, little bitty thing. I said, tear that old house down, pile it up, and let's burn that thing. And he says about two hours later, that man calls me and says, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. He said, try me. He said, you, you just need to come here. You, you remember years ago, these old, some of you women might remember these gallon, skippy, no, Peter Pan peanut cans. 
That house had five or six of those things in it. The man said, I almost didn't see it. I ran over one, it broke open and threw it out there. Inside that man, this man had wads of $100 bills wrapped up in a plastic trash bag just, just full of that. There were thousands and thousands of dollars. Five or six of those cans full of $100 bills. Hallelujah. Waiting to be handed to the man of God. When, when the book of Ecclesiastes says that this is, this is the work that God gives to the miser and the pinch penny to store up wealth so that he can give it to, into the hands of people that will have pity on the poor. God's going to bless you, church. God's going to give you stock tips. God's going to wake you up in the middle of the night and tell you, buy this worthless piece of stock. And when he tells you that, you better buy that worthless piece of stock because it's not going to be worthless for very long. God might, I I don't know how God is going to do it, but he is fixing to bring hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of dollars into the hands of the, the ministry of this church. Now, you must be faithful over it. You must be willing to give what God tells you to give. I have a friend of mine, Mark Hankins. His father, B.B. Uh, uh, Hankins, was in a building program. And God had prospered a businessman in his church. And through, through the hand of God, he had brought a million dollars into his hands. And, and, and he was praying and he was asking the, uh, asking the Lord, how much do you want to give me to the building fund? They were in a big building program. And the Lord said, give it all. And the man said, well, Lord, that's all I've got. That's all I made. The Lord said, you want want to make any more? So he he wrote the check out. Mark said, I was standing there when the man came in and handed my dad that check for a million dollars for, for the building program that they were in. Miracles. Miracles of God. God is is going to work miracles. God is going to do miracles. And God's going to bless you like like you never never thought you would ever be blessed in your life. I'm here to tell you, we're we're going to see oil oil and gas return. We're, We're going to see property values shoot through the roof. You're going to see things begin to happen. Yeah, hallelujah. I got one man says he receives that. The rest of you, will you receive that? And would you be willing to obey God with what he puts in your hands? Hallelujah. The wealth of, of the wicked is laid up for the just. Uh, people talk about Solomon built the temple. Well, he actually constructed it, but it was his father David that had it all waiting on him. Tons of gold, tons of silver the cedars of Lebanon, all the brass and iron, all the metal he would ever need. He had it all waiting on him. All all Solomon had to do when when he stepped in there was was get the plan and build it. When, When God took Moses out of Egypt, he transferred the wealth of Egypt into the hands of those people for the express purpose of building a temple that God could come and tabernacle with his people. And what was left over, Moses had to tell the people, stop bringing the money in. We have more than enough. Don't bring any more. There is a blessing which comes upon you, folks. God is is about to shake the finances of this nation like never before. There there are people that are... are, uh, And, and uh, Pastor, Brother Danny, I want you to understand, just like the prophet Elijah, Elisha and uh, Naaman had, had a strange relationship, God will bring to you relationships with, with I won't say strange people, but you would have never thought in a, in a hundred years God would have ever brought me across that person or that person get interested in what we were doing. Amen. Amen. But this is what God is going, this is what God's going to do, church. Hallelujah. I want you to be, I want you to be ready for it. And as, as, as you send things out, and, and, and please don't, don't think I'm, I'm fixing to take up an offering for another project. 
praise God for that, but, but as, as things go out, it is going to flow back in. And God is going to bring from, from, to you amazing gifts of God, and God will bring to you people from the other side of the world. Amen? I, I know in my own life, my ministry started as, as a mission and as feeding the hungry. It all started when Dr. Lester Summerall, who was a missionary, and that uh, God told him that he was putting him into this ministry. And he had a program of Feed the Hungry. And he asked people just fast on Fridays from noon, from breakfast until noon. And the money you would have spent, just, just mail that in, give it to your church, mail it in, and we're going to feed the hungry with it. And that's where I started. I started just, just 5 or $10 into that particular envelope. And then and here we are, God has, has, years and years later, here we are feeding the hungry in, in these countries also. So you never, you never despise the days of small beginnings. And, you, and, and all because you start small does not mean you remain small, and all because you're small doesn't mean you can't do great things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, praise the Lord. Now, one thing about, about ministry gifts is, is they are that. They are a gift. I had, the, I had the wonderful privilege of traveling uh, across Mexico with, with an apostle of God and, and Brother M.L. Kincaid, an amazing man. He, he lived in California as a young man. And T.L. and Daisy Osborne used to stay in his home when he was a boy. And he would give them his bed and sleep on the couch. And, and he told me and, and, uh, that when, when he, uh, Brother Kincaid has a ministry in Mexico and in Guatemala. And he said Brother, Brother T.L. Osborne came to Guatemala with him one time. And he said in Guatemala they, they allow... At, at the uh, post office, that's where they would allow the, the beggars to be, people that were crippled. And there were 22 blind men that were at the post office until Osborne came by, laid his hands on them, and all 22 people instantly received their sight, and the gospel door to Guatemala was open. Hallelujah. And Brother Kincaid said, when, when your friend Lester Summerall came with that big ship full of food, it really blew the doors wide open to the Pentecostal message of Jesus Christ. Now, the thing about it is, that was not the only place those miracles happened. I called Brother, Kin Brother Kincaid. Uh, I was traveling with him. And it was so amazing just listening to this man of God. Went to, he said uh, he went to Mexico in 1960. Which, uh, what's that, 60, 63 years ago. And when I was there, we'd stop at these traffic lights and kids would come out selling candy and all this kind of stuff. He said, when I first came down here, people would come out selling toucan birds and baby tigers, all kinds of stuff at the stop signs. And he said, he, he, he just began to talk about, as we traveled down, he said, now, he said, Brother Moffat, right here, he said, this hardware store, he says, I was coming out of this hardware store of a church we built about 30 miles down the road and I was coming out here and a woman came up because and said, missionary man, because back in 1960, if you was a white man in that part of Mexico, you was a missionary. And so uh, she, she said, missionary man, would you pray for my son? And her son was blind. He said, well, I put the stuff in the back of my truck and wiped my hands and just laid hands on him, prayed a simple prayer. God opened that boy's eyes. That woman went to screaming and praising God. People became running from everywhere, wanting to know what all the screaming was about. And he said, I, I, I just let the tailgate of my truck down, got up in the back of my truck and started preaching Jesus to them, got people saved. He said, I built a church, got a thousand people in it now. Be, we'll see it in just a few minutes, but right around the corner here. And he has, he has built more than two, but, uh, 300 churches he has built there. And most of them were by, by miracles of God that took place. But see, the miracles there are going to come here also. Uh, last, last time I... Uh, uh, I talked to uh, Ken, Brother Kincaid not too long ago. He's in his mid-80s, and he was out in California. And he said, you know, strangest meeting I was ever in in my life. 
he said, we was out there preaching, and he said, uh, you know, uh, this, he said, this girl came in. He said, I've never seen this before. Very strange. She had a real little short pair of cutoffs and a, and a brassiere. all she had on, nothing else. And she cried the whole sermon. But she, she was raised by atheists and uh, was, you know, was just at her wit's end, thought about committing suicide, but she remembered her parents told her, well, you know, they're crazy Christian people, but they're nice. So she said, she just came down here. And, and God gloriously saved her, filled her with the Holy Ghost. He said, but Brother Moffat, also while I was there, for the 26th time in my life, I laid hands on a blind person, and God allowed me to see him perform a miracle by Ooh, opening their blinded Lord. eyes. Hallelujah. See, w w when you send things out, it always comes back in. Amen, Lord. Signs and wonders and miracles, that, and, and it brings deposits, gifts of the Holy Ghost. Now, let me give you a scripture. Uh, get my glasses on, praise God. Are you still here? You gone home? We're going to be through in just a moment. Uh, but I want to show you something here in the Bible. If, if uh, I can get my pages to turn in the book of Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 2 says in verse 4 that God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. See, he lists some of them, and then he just talks about gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, the, the, the Lord blessed my wife with the gift of laying hands on people, uh, women that are barren, and they have children. And you know, it talks about over in the fifth chapter uh, of the book of Mark that, you know, when, when this woman touched Jesus, he felt power go out of him. And she can feel people take hold of that and when they don't take hold of it. Praise God. But see, that's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I believe there are some children, some babies in this church that she helped. Well, amen. That's gifts of the Holy Spirit. So I, I'm going to turn the service back to you, Pastor, in just a moment. But I, I would... Okay, the last Bible conference we had... Uh, we were uh, with a friend of mine, Bishop King Gory, and you, you see that club on the back table. He gave that to me. I'm now a Maasai elder, praise God. <laughs> but uh, at his church, we, we were preaching, and wasn't necessarily, we were just preaching on faith, but not necessarily healing, but preaching on faith. And uh, there was one man there, it just it acted like he just wasn't engaged at all, Amen, but he had, he had up in his nose, had growth up there, he couldn't breathe, and the doctors were talking about major surgery to clean his nose out. God instantly healed him, and then there was another man there. His wife had left him. It looked like he had been in a, a, a fire or something because his face looked like it was almost uh, not flexible anymore. And, and his jaw was kind of like this when he talked. And his wife said, you're, you're too ugly for me to live with you anymore, and took the kids and left him. Ooh. He was going to commit suicide, but somebody said, well, come down to the, this meeting, the, the beautiful singing and stuff. And, and God just turned his life around God, and, and inspired him. He said, you know, God just restoring his life. So these are things, see, that you're helping to happen over there. Deposits of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, one more thing I want to do. I, I want someone to go and get Miss Amy, okay? Just... Praise God, if you'll, if, you'll, if you'll go get her. And then uh, it's coming up on noon. But uh, I, I used to always tell the people in the church I pastor, there will still be food there when you get there. And I'm, do, I'm doing you a service by running over because all those other folks that got out of church early be out of your way. You can just walk in and sit down and eat. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, I was in here, I, uh, I don't know, I'd have to go look outside. I was looking at that today where Brother Jesse Duplantis paid off your, your uh, building. And I don't know if y'all remember this, but I think it was the Sunday before he came, I was there and said, said something to the effect of don't think it would be a strange thing if God just paid your building off. Amen, Lord. So I believe that should add some validity to what I'm saying to Amen. you. But praise the Lord. I had, I had intended to minister on something completely different today. I was just going to give a lesson on faith 
calling things that be not as though they were and just talk about how that God gave authority to you. But the Lord kind of changed everything while I was sitting in that seat right there. Glory to God. Your pastor and I did not corroborate on this. I didn't see him here today until just a few minutes. Come here if you would, please. I, want to, I just want to share this. Ron, I want you to come here. Amen, Praise God. Amen, Praise Lord. God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. The Lord wanted me to tell you that he is going to take you over to visions, dreams, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen, and what's known in his word as the discerning of spirits is going to begin to function and operate in your life. And you're, you're going to move over into those areas of visions and dreams. And God's going to show you things that are going to come to pass before they come to pass. To, to wake you in the night seasons. That you, that you might have a, a prayers and intercession for those things. And to know the things that are coming in advance. To prepare for them. But I'm taking you over to visions, dreams, and revelations of the Holy Spirit. I will open my word to you in ways that, and, and in things that you've never seen it before. And I will cause you to write books also that will minister specifically to people in situations so that they, they can move forward in the things of God in their life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Distributions. See, gifts and callings and distributions of the Holy Ghost. What, what is known, see, what is known in the Word as a prophetic mantle, a prophetic anointing, is it going to slowly begin to work and function in your life as you begin to operate in these things. Gifts of prophecy, tongues interpretation, and discerning of spirits in those things to move in the, to those gifts to begin to move forward in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the living God. Praise the living God. Thank you, Lord. Now we're going we're gonna to pause. Hmm? McKenna? Call her up. Praise God. McKenna, come here, baby. Is your name McKenna? Come this way. Put your hopper. Top of that. God. Praise the Lord. All right. Praise God. Well, praise the Lord. I'm going to have your pastor come back and uh, take charge of this service. I just want to say we love you very much. Appreciate all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.